Hey guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. On this video, I'm gonna be covering more genital urinary disorders. Now, I know I covered this on another video, but there are so many disorders to cover, so much content to cover, I couldn't do it just in one video, okay? Guys, if you haven't done so already, please don't forget to like and subscribe below. Be sure to check me out. I'm now on TikTok and Instagram. My handle's still the same, Nexus Nursing. First question. The client's admitted to a nursing unit from a long-term care facility with a hematocrit of 56% and serum sodium of 152. Which condition is a cause of these findings? One, overhydration. Two, anemia. Three, dehydration. Or four, renal failure. And guys, the correct answer is three, dehydration. Look at that sodium level. That sodium is 152. What's our normal sodium supposed to be? 135 to 145. So when you see that sodium excessively high, you need to be suspecting dehydration. Number three is the correct answer. Uh, before I move on to the next question, so inversely, when you see the uh, sodium excessively low, you need to be thinking that, that patient's going through fluid overload. And the reason why you see the sodium so low is because it's being diluted by all of the fluid. Next question. The nurse writes the client problem of fluid volume excess. Which intervention should be included in the plan of care? One, change IV fluid from uh, normal saline to D5W. Two, restrict the sodium in the client's diet. Three, monitor blood glucose levels. Or four, prepare the client for hemodialysis. And guys, the correct answer is to restrict sodium in the client's diet. Why? Because in the question, it says that the patient has fluid volume excess. They already have too much fluids, right? The more sodium that the patient has, the more they're going to hold on to their fluid. And we don't want the patient holding on to their fluid. We're actually trying to get rid of fluid. So that's why number two is the correct answer. We're trying to decrease the fluid. So we're going to decrease the sodium. The client's admitted with a serum sodium, a level of 110. Which nursing diagnosis should be implemented? One, encourage fluids orally. Two, administer 10% saline solution IV push. Three, administer antidiuretic hormone intranasally. Or four, place on seizure precautions. And guys, the correct answer, you're gonna place the patient on seizure precautions. Again, your sodium levels 135 to 145. Guys, 135 to 145. When you see that sodium low like this, like when it gets lower than 120, that patient needs to be on seizure precautions because that's a risk. The patient can start having seizures. The telemetry monitor technician notifies the nurse of the morning telemetry reading. Which client should the nurse assess first? One, the client in normal sinus rhythm with peak T wave. Two, client with AFib with a rate of 100. Three, client diagnosed with MI who has occasional PVCs. Or four, client with a first degree AV block and a rate of 92. Okay, guys, and the correct answer is one, the client in normal sinus rhythm with a peak T wave. Why? Peak T wave. Um, what should you be thinking about? Hyperkalemia. What happens when a patient has hyperkalemia? Dysrhythmias. That's life-threatening. So that's going to be our priority patient. That's who we're going to be running to first, okay? Now, a matter of fact, before I move on, let me go over these wrong answer choices with you. Two, the client diagnosed with AFib with a heart rate of 100. Well, the client has AFib, so the heart rate is going to be increased. But guess what? Heart rate's 100. What's our normal heart rate? 60 to 100. So, you, yes, we're going to assess this patient, but is that a patient we need to be running to first? No. Next one, client uh, who had an MI who has occasional PVCs. Most people experience occasional PVCs. No reason to be running to this patient. And for the cli for, uh, client with first degree AV block that has a rate of 92, this patient's not in immediate danger. The one who is in immediate danger is the one with that PT wave and we're suspecting hyperkalemia. We don't want that patient to have dysrhythmia, so we're gonna be running to them. Which statement indicates discharge teaching has been effective for a client who's post-op TERP? TERP, guys, is transurethral uh, resection of prostate. Uh, one, I'll call the surgeon if I experience any difficulty urinating. Two, I'll take my proscar daily, the same as before my surgery. Three, I'll continue restricting my oral fluid intake. Four, I'll take my pain medication routinely, even if I do not hurt. And guys, the correct answer is one. I'll call the surgeon if I experience difficulty urinating. Um, the patient just had a terp, and the whole point 
of that turp was to um, get rid of the obstruction, right? So if this patient is still having difficulty uh, urinating, yes, absolutely, they need to reach out to their healthcare uh, provider. Choice two, I'll take my ProScar daily. That shouldn't be necessary after surgery. That patient shouldn't have to be taking ProScar after the patient had the TERP. Choice three, I'll continue restricting my oral uh, fluid intake. That's not necessary either. And four, I'll take my pain medication routinely. Excuse me? Do we ever take pain medication routinely? Absolutely not. Pain medications given how? As needed, PRN. So the correct answer is one. The client is one day post-op TERP. Which task should the nurse delegate to the UAP? UAP, guys, is un unlicensed assistive personnel. One, increase irrigation fluid to clear clots from tubing. Two, elevate scrotum on the towel roll for support. Three, change the dressing on the first post-op day. Four, teach a client how to care for continuous irrigation catheter. Okay, guys, and the correct answer is two. Out of these choices, that's the only thing that the UAP can do. Elevate that scrotum to what? Provide support. Now, let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, increasing the irrigation fluid to clear clots from the tubing. Doesn't that require assessment? Doesn't that require clinical um, um, nursing judgment? The UAP can't do that. Choice two, change the dressings the first post-op day. Actually, the first post-op day, even the RN's not going to do that. Who's going to change that dressing? The surgeon. Why? The surgeon wants to take a look, see how um, that wound is looking, and the surgeon's going to give orders after they look at um, that wound, right? So that first wound is not even going to be changed by the nurse. It's going to be changed by the doctor, the surgeon. And choice four, teach. Let me stop right there. Can UAPs teach? No. Matter of fact, the registered nurse cannot delegate anything that is teaching, evaluating, or assessing. The RN must keep those type of patients, okay? The client with a TERP who had a continuous irrigation catheter complains of the need to urinate. Which intervention should the nurse implement first? One, call the surgeon to inform the doctor of the client's complaints. Two, administer the client a narcotic medication for pain. Three, explain to the client that the sensation happens frequently. Or four, assess the continuous irrigation catheter for patency. And guys, the correct answer is number four. You can assess first, guys. That's the first um, step of the nursing process. The only time when you're answering a question you don't assess first is when you're given enough information you, that in the question, you can tell you already assessed the patient because obviously, if you have all of this information, how would you have gotten it? You had to have assessed the patient. That's the only time you're going to skip the assessment part to um, intervention, right? But a question like this, we haven't even intervened the patient. We haven't intervened. We haven't even uh, assessed the patient. So you can't go into intervening or teaching without even assessing the patient. Now, I know most of you or many of you wanted to run to three, explain that the sensation happens frequently. It does happen frequently, but you have to assess your patient first because what if something else is going on with the patient? So you can't just assume you have to assess the patient, okay? You um, don't wanna just dismiss the patient's complaint. You are, whenever a patient has a complaint, you're gonna assess first. The client who is post-op TERP asked the nurse, when will I know if I'll be able to have uh, sex after my TERP? Which response is most appropriate by the nurse? One, you seem anxious about your surgery. Two, tell me about your fears of impotency. Three, uh, potency can return in six to eight uh, weeks. Or four, did you ask your doctor about your concern? And guys, the correct answer is three. Potency can return in six to eight weeks. The patient wanted to know when they can start having sex again, and you're answering in six to eight weeks. You're answering the question. Look at how they tried to trick you. They gave you some beautiful answer choices. They gave you some therapeutic responses. But in this situation, a therapeutic response wasn't appropriate. This patient isn't anxious. This patient isn't in distress. They're asking you a simple question and you need to answer it. But look how they tried to trick you. They wanted you to say, ooh, therapeutic response. Ooh, reflection. Ooh, restatement. Let me jump on it. No. 
That's not appropriate. In this situation, the patient's asking a simple question and that question needs to be answered. So the correct answer is going to be three, six to eight weeks. Before I move on, let's go over the wrong answer choices. Um, I talked to you about one and two. Those are therapeutic, beautiful therapeutic responses, but not for this question. They're wrong. And the last one, did you talk to your doctor about it? How many times did I tell you not to pass the buck? You don't ever pass the buck, okay? If it's something that you are able to address, the patient asks you, you answer them. You don't pass the buck off to the doctor or anyone else. All right, next question. The client asks, what does an elevated PSA mean? Uh, which scientific rationale should the nurse base the response? One, elevated PSA can result from several different causes. Two, elevated PSA can be only from prostate cancer. Three, elevated PSA can be diagnostic for testicular cancer. Or four, elevated PSA is the only test used to diagnose BPH. Now, before I tell you what the answer is, automatically as a student, if you have been following me for any amount of time, automatically you should have ruled out number two and number four. Why? Because of the word only. Only, always, never, right? Those all inclusive words. Do we pick them? No, we don't pick those type of answers unless we know that we know that we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that that's the answer. And most of the time, that's not the answer, right? So you should have gotten rid of number two and number four. That should have left you with number one, and number three. Number three is wrong because a PSA is not diagnostic for, um, for testicular cancer. For a patient to be diagnosed with testicular cancer, they do a combination of what? Um, a, digital, uh, um, a digital exam and what? The PSA. But the PSA alone is not diagnostic, so that's wrong. And the correct answer is number one, an elevated PSA can result from several different causes, such as what? infection of the prostate, inflammation of the prostate. So just because that in, um, the PSA is elevated, it doesn't specifically mean that the patient has BPH or that they have prostate cancer. The client returned from surgery after having a TERP and has pulse 110, respirations 24, blood pressure 90 over 40, cool clammy skin. What intervention should the nurse implement, select all that applies? Guys, how do we treat select all that applies? As what? True or false? Okay, let's go. One, assess the urine in the continuous irrigation drainage bag. Absolutely. Why? We're suspecting that the patient's hemorrhaging. How many times have I told you? I don't care what kind of surgery the patient had. If a patient had surgery, what are our top three concerns? DVT or pulmonary embolism. Infection or what? Hemorrhage. Bleeding. Now look at the question. It says that the pulse is up the blood pressure is down that by itself should make you think bleeding but they still were so kind even if when they gave you the increased pulse and the decreased blood pressure in case you still didn't get it they backed it up with cool clammy skin you're supposed to be thinking what hemorrhage this patient's losing blood so one absolutely we want to assess the urine for continuous irrigation Drainage bag, is that dra uh, bag bright red? Why is it bright red? Because of all that blood the patient's losing, right? Choice two, decrease irrigation fluid in the continuous irrigation catheter. <coughs> Excuse me. False. This patient's losing um, blood. Why would we want to decrease the irrigation? No. We want to do what? Increase the irrigation, right? So that's false. We're not going to keep that. Three, lower the head of the bed while raising the foot of the bed. Absolutely. Putting that patient in Trendelenburg position is going to bring more blood to the heart, more blood to the um, brain. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to keep that. Choice four, contact the doctor to give an update on the client's condition. Of course, because we're going to need orders, right? Absolutely. You're going to call the doctor. Five, check the client's uh, pre-op, creatinine, and BUN. False. We're worried about this patient is bleeding out. This is not the time for us to be looking at the BUN and creatinine. What is that going to tell us about that patient bleeding out? This patient is bleeding out, and we know that because we assess them. How do I know we assess them? How would I have gotten the pulse? How would I have gotten the blood pressure? How would I have known that their uh, skin was cool and clammy if I didn't assess them? So we assessed already. Now it's time for action, all right? So we're going to try to um, keep that patient from going into shock. All right, next question.
The nurse is caring for a client with a TERP, which expected outcome indicates the client's condition is improving. One, client's using a maximum amount allowed by the PCA pump. That's false. That patient's not getting better if they're using the max on the PCA, that, their pain's not being controlled. So that's false. Oh, I'm sorry, this wasn't, even, <laughs> this wasn't even a select all that applies. So, well, guys, you know, number one is not the answer. Let me give you the other choices. Two, the client's bladder spasms are relieved by medication. Three, the client's scrotum is swollen and tender with movement. Or four, the client has passed a large, hard brown stool in the morning or this morning. And your correct answer is two, the client's bladder spasms are relieved by the medication. That's how you know it's getting better. Now let's look at our wrong answer choices. I already went over one. So number two, the scrotum is swollen and tender. That's not good. That doesn't mean the patient's improving. That's bad. We want to see decreased edema, okay? And choice number four, the client passed a large, hard brown stool. What does that mean when it's large and it's hard? That patient's constipated. So guess what they're doing when they're having a bowel movement? They're straining. This patient just had surgery in that area and now they're straining. That, this is why we give the patient laxatives. We don't want them straining. We don't want them putting pressure on that site. So that's false. Number two is the correct answer. The client diagnosed with renal calculi is admitted to the medical unit. Which intervention should the nurse implement first? One, monitor the client's urinary output. Two, assess the client's pain and rule out complications. Three, increase the client's oral fluid intake. Or four, use a safety gate belt when ambulating the client. And I'm smiling because I love this answer so much because I talked to you guys about this on the video I did on how to pass big tests such as the NCLEX, ATI, and HESI. And I talked about this ad nauseum. So I'm hoping you guys get this answer correct the answer is two assessing them for pain and if you're thinking well professor d you always say pain never killed anyone i do always say that but what's the rest of what i say i say pain never killed anyone except in certain situations and i mean to say that so you can know how important pain is in certain situations what are they am i Myocard infarction, okay? Pain is a priority. Burns, pain is a priority. Sickle cell, pain is a priority. And stones, and I don't care if they're calcium stones, if they're struvite stones, oxalate, I don't care. If they're stones, they are a priority. And it says right here that the patient, um, has a renal calculi, that's a kidney stone. So pain is a priority and that's why number two is our correct answer. The client with possible renal calculi is scheduled for a renal ultrasound. Which intervention should the nurse implement for this procedure? One, ask if the client's allergic to shellfish or iodine. Two, keep the client NPO for eight hours before the ultrasound. Three, ensure the client has signed, a con signed an informed consent or four, explain the test is non-invasive and there's no discomfort. And guys, the correct answer is four. You're gonna teach the patient this is a non-invasive um, test. They basically will put the gel on the patient's back and then they'll put that transducer on their back. And what happens is the transducer generates these um, sound waves and that sound wave produces a picture so they can visualize the kidneys, okay? So number four is the correct answer. There's no contrast media or anything like that. A patient doesn't have to be NPO. Correct answer is four. Which clinical manifestation should the nurse expect to assess for the client diagnosed with utero renal stone? One, dull aching flank pain and microscopic hematuria. Two, nausea, vomiting, pallor, cool, clammy skin. Three, gross hematuria, hematuria and dull suprapubic pain with voiding or four. The client will be asymptomatic. Well, you know it's not four because I just told you pain is a priority in burns, sickle cell, um, myocardial infarction, and um, stones. So we know it's not four. So you're between one, two, and three. And guys, the correct answer is two. Nausea, vomiting, pallor, cool, clammy skin. You wanna know what's causing all those symptoms? the severe pain that the patient is in, 
okay? This type of pain is so severe that the patient can pass out because they can't take it anymore, okay? Kidney, um, kidney stones are the worst type of pain the patient can ever have, okay? So that nausea, the vomiting, the pallor, cool clammy skin, that's caused by the severe pain that the patient's going through. So correct answer is number two. The client is diagnosed with an acute episode of urinal calculi. I didn't say that right. Which client problem is priority when caring for this client? One, fluid volume loss. Two, knowledge deficit. Three, impaired urinary elimination. Or four, alteration in, com in comfort. And you all should get this answer correct. Did you notice the past two, three questions we did are basically telling you the same thing? That's how important it is to know that pain is a priority when it comes to stones. So the correct answer is four, alteration is in comfort. You think this patient is going to be com comfortable? Absolutely not. They're going to be in pain. Okay. How is it? Oh my goodness, guys, we're already down to our last question. I think I'm gonna have to do a part three because there's so much more I wanna cover with you guys. All right, but we're down to our last question. Which intervention is most important for the nurse uh, to implement for the client diagnosed with rule out renal calculi? One, assess client's neurological status every two hours. Two, strain all the urine and send any sediment to the laboratory. Three, monitor the client's BU and creatinine levels. Or four, take 24-hour dietary recall during the client's interview. And the correct answer, guys, and this is a famous nursing question, so don't forget it. Two, straining all of the urine and any sediment that's caught to send it to the lab. Why? We won't know what type of diet to teach the patient to have, what type of food to tell them to stay away from until we know what kind of stones they have. Is it calcium? Is it struvite? Is it oxalate? We don't know. Is it phosphorus? We don't know. So we need to know what type of stones the patient has so the doctor can know what kind of meds they're going to order for the patient, what kind of therapy the patient's going to have, what kind of diet they're going to be on. So it's very important for that urine to be strained and for that sediment to be sent to the lab, okay? Now let's look at our wrong answer choices. One, assessing their neurological status every two hours. Okay, if you go back to the question, we're trying to rule out renal calculi. Whenever something says rule out, that means... That's what we think it is. And so we're trying to rule everything out so we can prove this is what the patient has, right? So when we want to rule out renal calculi, that means we think it's renal calculi. So how can we prove it's renal calculi? So how is doing a neuro check every two hours going to prove that? Wrong. So you get rid of that. Three, checking their BUN and creatinine levels. Checking their BUN and creatinine levels is great to let us know how the kidneys are functioning, how well they're functioning, how well they're uh, um, filtering toxins from the blood, right? That's what the BUN and creatinine tells us. But that BUN and creatinine, that's not gonna tell us if the patient has renal calculi. So that's wrong. Choice four, taking a 24 hour dietary recall, us knowing what the patient ate for the past 24 hours, that's not gonna tell us if the problems are urinary calculi. What will tell us if the problems are urinary calculi and what type of urinary calculi it is, is straining the urine and then testing what we find, okay? So that's why number two is the correct answer. Guys, I can't believe how quickly this time went by. I hope this video was helpful for you. If there's anything that I haven't covered that you'd like to see me covered, please go ahead and leave me a comment below. Don't forget to check out my uh, TikTok. I'm now on TikTok and the content that I cover there is different than what I cover here. So if you'd like some extra studying with me, be sure to check out my TikTok, Nexus Nursing. I'm also on Instagram, Nexus Nursing. And guys, I have audio lessons that are available on my website. So whatever you're struggling with right now in school, if you want to hear my voice talking about the subject matter and explaining to you what's important, why you need to know it, what, you, you know, what, uh, contents you're most likely going to see on your exam, make sure you check out nexusnursinginstitute.com and check out my audio lessons. Now, guys, listen, it's just me by myself, and I'm making these audio lessons for the very beginning of the program to graduation. So 
I'm not even a quarter of the way done. So every week I'm adding new courses, I'm adding new lessons. So if you go to Nexus Nursing Institute and you don't see what you want today, keep checking because eventually it's gonna be uploaded because I upload new lessons and courses every week. So guys, with that being said, thank you so much for spending this time with me and I'll see you on my next video.